Welcome to Censored, the podcast that will poison your mind with filth. I'm Aoife Vritnach, a historian whose morals have been entirely corrupted by inappropriate reading. According to the censors, anyway. This episode is all about the public library, the place where my own fall from grace began. Censorship and public libraries are in the news a lot right now because the American culture wars are currently focused on school libraries. Now, the US situation is obviously completely different to Ireland, past or present. To start with, we don't have public schools with taxpayer-funded libraries in them. 95% of our schools are privately owned and managed. And none of the schools I attended had libraries. Before university, the only place I borrowed books from was my local city library. The other difference, of course, with the US is the way democracy works at a local level. The way people vote in the two systems, their opportunities for voting, the officers they elect, it's all completely different. So why am I bothering to compare them at all? Seems nonsensical, right? Well, not entirely. There are important similarities. There are posturing politicians making inflammatory statements in both countries. Well-organized pressure groups running single-issue campaigns, yes. Public servants, that is librarians, trying to do their job without getting into too much trouble? Also yes. And most importantly of all, in both situations, reading is associated with undesirable social change. The degradation of society is blamed on novels and sex manuals. With the future of society on the line, censorship and suppression seem completely justifiable. If the alternative is social Armageddon, sure what harm can a little censorship do? Librarians in Ireland were caught up in this politicisation of reading in the same way that US librarians are today. So far, there haven't been many history books written about censorship in the Irish Library. I'm not sure why. Maybe it's because the official blacklist is just so fascinating. And on a national level, you've all those loony laity pressure groups with their ridiculous names like the Catholic Truth Society and the League of Decency. I mean, I get it. We have to get our kicks where we can when our work is reading old dusty files and papers full of dull stuff. But it is time to consider libraries, I think, because they feature in Sean O'Fueloin's list that he called the seven censorships. I've already done two episodes featuring O'Fueloin extensively. He's just never far away from this topic. You might remember that he was a famous anti-censorship campaigner. He edited the Bell magazine and his fiction writing was banned by the censors. He thought deeply about how censorship worked and came up with a list of the seven deadly sins of censorship and censure. Obviously, the state board is on the list, but it's just one of many forms of suppression. And I would argue maybe it's not even the most important one. The other six censorships were fear, the bookseller, librarians library users, library committees, and the public, especially clergymen. I think the last episode on visual art covered how fear worked, how artists worried about their finances and reputation in an unforgiving prudish Ireland. So this time, I'll talk about three of the seven censorships, those relating to libraries, librarians, library users, and library committees. For one institution to appear more than once on O'Fueloin's list suggests they're pretty important. I'll start with librarians. Being a librarian was a big deal, and it was a job mostly reserved for unmarried women. When you look at the lists of personnel for libraries, women were for once overrepresented. Although that does depend, Cork City and County, where I live, preferred to appoint men, naturally. Anyway, apart from Cork, there were lots of women running library services across the country. I was reading their trade journal on Lowerlin, which is the Irish for library, where I met Miss Nora Connolly, county librarian for Wexford. She was tireless, organised and dangerously competent, writing updates on her own library service and then gathering all the news from the other places so their librarians didn't have to do any work. During the Second World War, she extended her service to barracks and camps where the newly mobilised defence forces were living. 
bringing novels, plays and non-fiction to all those young men in uniform. And best of all, from my point of view anyway, she said what they preferred to read. Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca was wildly popular, as were the plays of George Bernard Shaw. The lads were also reading a lot of non-fiction relevant to their work, like accounts of Blitzkrieg and Hitler's Mein Kampf. Yes, I know, Mein Kampf. They were reading it in their droves in Wexford in the 1940s. A bit fucking creepy, if I'm honest. Bear in mind that wartime censorship of the press was so strict that neither side could be seen as good or bad, like they were trying not to take sides in press censorship. And out there in rural and urban Ireland, people are reading Mein Kampf. It's just fucked up. Clearly, censorship in the Second World War wasn't as thorough as we'd like to believe. Nora Connolly herself was very pleased that the Defence Forces were such enthusiastic readers, and she didn't judge them for what they wanted to read. She ran a popular service and was justifiably proud of her achievements, especially because it was always on a shoestring. Local authorities never wanted to pay for these things because it involved raising the rates. So any new work was done on very little money. In her writings to this journal in the 40s, Connolly never mentioned censorship, though. I've no idea whether she liked it or hated it. In general, not many of them mention censorship directly. They kind of skirt around the topic quite a bit. I suppose it's hardly surprising. It's a done deal by now. The Act has been in place since 1929. But a colleague of hers from another county, Veronica McCarthy, wrote a long piece called Some Problems of an Irish County Librarian that included a detailed analysis of the difficulties with censorship. She thought there wasn't enough of it. And I mean, I cannot believe she said this in 1943. At this time, some newspapers were submitting their entire copy to a censor before they could publish it. The censorship board was working away on books and magazines with no sign of slacking off. In 1942, they had banned the Taylor and Anstey. And I've done an episode on that already and I can assure you it was not smutty at all, not even a tiny bit. But she still thought too much filth was getting through. In fact, she painted herself as the front line of defence against filth. She said that books were banned because people like her, in her position, sent them to the censorship board. This was because she received the books directly from the publishers. McCarthy wasn't very pleased she had to do this work, because inevitably she couldn't get it right all of the time. She did not like the, quote, resultant odium of public opinion, unquote, that fell on her shoulders. Being an arbiter of taste and decency was a tough job, and no one seemed to appreciate it. McCarthy wanted librarians to encourage moral reading, to provide works that would improve minds and souls. Now, to be fair, this was not a far-right position. It was the reason libraries existed in the first place. Publicly funded libraries were established as part of an egalitarian project to bring education to the masses. The idea was that with more books, and more importantly, better books, Minds would be elevated, behaviour would improve, and better citizenship would result. Of course, in this scenario, the reading material has to set the right tone. There's no point giving a service to the poor if it'll corrupt their morals. From the very beginning, then, librarians envisage themselves as censors, or at the very least curators of the collection. It actually wasn't the books where this was most obvious but in their newspaper offerings. Libraries were hugely popular because of the newspaper and magazine reading room, where men crowded around newspapers in lines two or three people deep sometimes. The numbers using these rooms were enormous. In 1906, in Cork City, an average of 895 men a day visited the newsroom. Now, in some libraries, there was also a ladies' room, because the staff noticed women were reluctant to use the male-dominated space. I mean, maybe the stink of intermittently washed men in damp wool coats put them off. Unfortunately, no one seems to have counted how many women used their room, so I can't give you any equivalent figures. Anyway, 
Newspapers were factual and relevant, so they seem educational, but they also contained trashy stories and, worst of all, horse racing news. Those thousands of readers a month had to be protected from dubious content. So in Cork City before 1930, library staff blacked out the racing results from the daily newspapers. Yes, they spent time every day erasing horse racing results. What a job. Thankfully, the Republican spirit infusing the new state finally put a stop to this. This is the explanation provided by the librarian to the Irish Times. He does not think that the poor man, for whose benefit the libraries were primarily set up, should be penalised by taking for him that which others can buy. I like that. That's much more egalitarian and a less paternalistic vision of the public library. But they haven't abandoned the mission to offer better, improving reading. Everyone still strongly believed in it. A senior politician told librarians at their 1948 conference, the reading of history, of biography and even fiction seemed vital if the people as a whole were to be good nationalists and citizens of the world. Of course he stressed history and biography as the best kind of reading. He does grudgingly admit that even fiction is worthwhile. This hierarchy, unfortunately, was pretty typical. It was a status hierarchy that elevated non-fiction, read overwhelmingly by men, over fiction, that genre beloved of women. Of course, it's easy to conceptualise non-fiction as educational. It's got facts and figures. It's about real life, if you want to call it that. But some library staff were a bit defensive about this status hierarchy and tried to point out the value of fiction. And this is from 1942, from someone in Ross Common, who said... Fiction is the chief wellspring of literature, the font from which is drawn the most refreshing drafts of intellectual delight. He asked his colleagues not to sneer at fiction, arguing that even the penny dreadful, which was the cheapest, trashiest stuff available, had its place. He wrapped up his plea with this smart nod to folk wisdom, saying, Everyone to her fancy, as the woman said when she kissed her cow. I don't know if he's making a point about snogging cattle, but it's certainly a memorable image. Still, it is fair to say that libraries were generally seen as educational institutions. They weren't for recreation or entertainment, really. So McCarthy, the censorious librarian, was in good company when she considered her job was to offer redeeming, morally upstanding works to her readers. If she couldn't do that, she could at least protect them from bad books that would pollute their minds. Really, she talked about contagion in her article. She did conceptualise books as carriers of disease. So that's librarians. But they weren't the only ones who determined what got onto the bookshelves. They aren't the final arbiters. I mean, can you imagine the responsibility for that? And the flack they'd get? Also, it's just not realistic for one person to curate an entire library. The Irish solution to this Irish problem was simple. Appoint a committee. Even better, appoint lots of committees. There was one National Book Selection Committee run by the Irish Library Association. This drew together recommendations from all the librarians into one place. Unfortunately, not everyone wanted to report to this committee. All they had to do was rate the book, put it on a postcard and send it off. But many librarians just didn't bother. I'm guessing this was because they had committee fatigue. As employees of local government, they were perhaps overly familiar with committees and the tedium. It's not surprising they didn't want to volunteer any more of their time. And of course, they had their own local book selection committees to manage. Seeing to these was part of their salary job, built into the fabric of running public libraries. Thing is, I don't know much yet about these committees, because other than the librarian, they were staffed by volunteers. Politicians didn't seem to join, which means they must have been very low status indeed in the political hierarchy. I really have no idea how people got onto a book selection committee, But being a Roman Catholic priest would certainly push you to the top of the queue. Sometimes the priest was a one-man committee, 
Librarians just forwarded their stock lists to local priests for their approval, just straightforwardly asking them to censor the entire library stock. I shouldn't be surprised. I've read enough primary documents from this period to see how the priests are treated, but oh my fucking God, the level of deference towards them was just unimaginable to me. It's no wonder they became power-mad egotists. They were given so much power willingly, they came to expect it and demand even more. But in fairness, most of the time, the priest was one of a group of dedicated volunteers. In Wexford, in Wexford, Father J.M. Butler was on the committee for at least 18 years, from 1924 to 42. But he wasn't the only long-term member. Three others had been there for the same length of time. So it's safe to say that this small group of people had a significant effect on book stock in Wexford County Libraries. But how do I even analyse that? Was there a big difference between counties in book purchasing? And was that attributable to their committees? Can I make a big argument about gender, politics and space from these book choices? I don't know if that's even possible, to be honest. If you've ever been on a committee you know how random some of the decisions are. It depends on who shows up to meetings, who's fighting with whom, who is charismatic or charming. There's a world of human messiness that produces bureaucracy. And I'd need huge amounts of documentation to try and iron that out and put it in the background and create a bigger narrative. But I can speculate. If the chair was a priest, and he usually was, and he had a hobby horse about a particular author, you can be sure those works were not stocked. Say if a chair hated Barbara Cartland. She was a romance novelist who started her career in 1925 and published a book or two a year. Her one effort at a sex manual was banned in Ireland, but otherwise she wasn't blacklisted. But if her work was deemed too trashy by a library selection committee, it wouldn't be stocked. What these committees did was make value judgments. They debated taste and literary standards. They were agents of censure or soft banning in the public library system. Perhaps one of their most important functions, though, was adjudicating on complaints. Which brings me on to the third form of censure, the library user. Actually, the people reading library books are key to the whole edifice of censorship and censure in libraries. You could say they're the most important people in this debate, the imagined or real court of public opinion. Librarians tried to keep them quiet because they had the most powerful weapon at their disposal, the complaint. Now, my compatriots listening would be surprised to hear that because contemporary Irish culture is extremely bad at complaining or being upfront about upset or anger. We do smile and nod when we should be politely insisting on more rights, more time, better service, you name it. This is because we're afraid of mortification, of making a scene. But it's obvious that in previous decades, plenty of people had no problem complaining about dirty books. This suggests that there was no mortification to be had because everyone agreed with them. Sometimes an outraged reader would complain to their local politician, who would then ramp up the rhetoric to score easy political points. In 1931, a Cork County councillor said this, It was his opinion that these books should not be allowed into any decent house or be read by any decent-minded person. The members of Cork County Council, he said, had a duty to perform to the people to see that their minds were not poisoned by the material which he alleged was being issued. Stirring stuff. He's trying to rouse a rabble here, isn't he? After this speechifying, the County Council agreed to ask the Library Committee to consider appointing a whole-time censor. I don't know what happened next, actually. Probably nothing. It often takes more than one complaint to make a procedural change like this. But it shows the potential power in complaining when the system is willing to take a complainant seriously. If everyone thinks censorship is a good thing, then it's easy to grant even more of it. And to be honest, there were very few dissenting voices who argued that there was too much censorship. Even those who believed it was too strict 
didn't argue against the principle, so there is a great deal of social consensus about the role that censorship plays. It's quite likely that Cork City Council already had a book selection committee, where complaints like this ended up. A committee is a great idea for political hot potatoes. It spreads the responsibility around, slows down the process and allows anger to dissipate. If worst comes to worst, the complaint can be misplaced to slow things down even more. Alas, I have no idea how these committees dealt with complaints. Maybe they promptly pulled the book from the shelves. Their work was just not transparent because they're not public representatives. Oh yeah, and loads of records haven't survived. That's the other reason. So censorship of local library stock was done in secret, not out in the open. Much like the censorship board themselves, there seems to be a pattern here. Using volunteers meant that even notional ideas of democracy could be bypassed. It also meant radicals could capture parts of government. All the pro-censorship types had to do was join a book selection committee and they could control the books in the public library system. The zealots from the Catholic Truth Society wouldn't have to work very hard to shape public library stock. And I have noticed that today's libraries have few of the formerly blacklisted books on their shelves. Some were out of print by the time they were legal to buy, but I suspect the caution and censoriousness was built into the system by the late 1960s, by the time changes were made. I'm just going to read out the recollection of a Cork member of a book selection committee. His name was John A. Murphy, and he was a historian from the city's university. In 1967, the year after I came on the committee, Brian Lenehan as Justice Minister began the unbanning process. But the censorship mentality was still deeply embedded in a prudish and hypocritical society, and it lingered for some time among library users. A not inconsiderable amount of our committee time was taken up with po-faced discussions of the suitability of certain books, which had been submitted by users to us according to the protocol of the marked passage, or indeed the marked individual word. It was a pleasure to have contributed a little to the ending of the old foolishness. In his recollection, the battle over smut continued beyond the censorship, according to the protocol of the marked passage, as he put it. And this selecting just one or two words was precisely the technique adopted by state censors. Now, contrary to what Murphy implies here, the censorship didn't actually end in 1967. Books and magazines were still banned in significant numbers until the mid-1970s at least. So it wasn't like the floodgates had opened and the libraries were filled with filth. But for some nervous ninnies, there was never going to be enough censorship. From the very beginning, people complained that the board wasn't strict enough and there were often calls for more and more censorship. Your one McCarthy, the librarian I quoted earlier, she was far from the only one who thought there just wasn't enough of it. But say the offended reader has complained and isn't happy with the results from the book selection committee. What can they do next? There was always direct action, of course, ripping the pages out or blotting out words with a pen. In the 1940s, librarians were baffled by Irish readers' habits of ripping out bits of the books. They expected, say, patterns, recipes or instructional stuff to be stolen, because that made a kind of sense. Sometimes it's just too tedious to copy out the recipe when you can just tear out a few pages. OK, it's not very civic-minded, but you know in general, we're not. What really confused librarians was that returned novels had bits missing. It's possible that zealous prudes were taking censorship into their own hands, not bothering to complain, and just ripping the bits out. Or there's another explanation, and this is the one that I prefer. Maybe the extremely vanilla sex scenes were being stolen for wanking material. I say sex scenes, but really it would just be a snog or a hint of a feel. Nonetheless, smut is relative, and if you're horny enough, anything can be titillating. Do you remember in John McGahern's The Dark how a teenage boy was wanking from an ad torn out of the newspaper? It must have happened with books as well. It just had to have. 
I love this idea, actually. Ireland, a nation of deprived sex maniacs vandalising library books to get their rocks off. I mean, it's just as likely as the other explanation, that the country was so repressed, even a snog sent readers into such a fury that they ripped the books apart. I can never prove either one happened, really, as I've speculated. I can only guess. But I don't know why we should presume it's censoriousness, not randiness, at work. We need to stop leaning into this holy Catholic Ireland thing and admit that sometimes people were dirty feckers. OK, I know I've just said that I see historical facts as ambiguous and double-sided, but sometimes they're just not. Undeniably, there were some loonies defacing books because they were offended. That was crazy enough, but sometimes it got completely out of hand. Librarians in County Mayo recalled this extraordinary incident. Now, I did refer to this before in the book burning episode, but I think it belongs here too, and it's worth remembering that this sort of madness did happen. A member of the library regularly destroyed books by blacking out with marker any words of a sexual nature. He had been asked by staff on a number of occasions to refrain from doing this. One day, the books were particularly badly marked. A staff member again explained that he couldn't continue in this manner, that the proper procedure was to show the offending books to staff and a complaint would be made to the county librarian. He didn't take too kindly to this. He proceeded to tear up the books, pile them on the floor, take out a bottle of paraffin and a box of matches from his pocket. By this time, the second member of staff had run for assistance. Luckily, the library was near the fire station. It took three people considerable time to get the man and the situation under control. I mean, it's fucking insane. I admit it sounds unlikely. It could be exaggerated. But having read these compilations of anecdotes from librarians, I have to say I'm convinced. They just saw hundreds, even thousands of members of the public each month. They saw all sorts all sorts of behaviour, and clearly some people are a bit strange. The anecdotes librarians told of the public were hilarious and often strained my credibility. But as that English saying has it, there's nout as queer as folk. So I do believe this happened, that a man went to the library with paraffin in his coat pocket. What's interesting about this story is that the librarian had tried to explain the complaints procedure but the protester was having none of it. Burning books was extreme, but I'm sure he wasn't the only one blacking out what he thought were rude bits. It looks like, in addition to censorship by committee, there was censorship by black pen and paraffin. Complaining takes many forms, I suppose. I'm just going to finish this up by saying that I don't believe reading can corrupt your morals. Honestly, I wish it was that easy to influence people. To pro-censorship types, a text is so radically powerful it can change the world. I do think reading can change your mind, but I don't think you can predict how or why. What a reader finds in a text is beyond anyone's control. The author, the librarian, parents, teachers. I don't think any of those people can control how reading affects an individual. Let's be honest, you can't even force people to read properly or carefully. In school, we were all made to read certain texts, but what sort of lessons did we learn and did we even read them properly? But yet, the question of censorship hangs on the power of the written word. Conservatives single out certain books as bad and others as good. I do think that's kind of nonsense. If reading about adultery made people unfaithful, Churches would have stopped reading out whole swathes of the Bible centuries ago. What censorious types want to do is control the reading experience because they're afraid of the independence it represents. Censors want to infantilize readers. They want to assume authority over their private inner lives. And that's what I find scary about book banning in publicly funded libraries, whether in Ireland in the 40s or America now. It's not just about the books. Censors want to mess with readers' heads. I wish there were lessons that anyone could learn from Irish censorship and how it worked and how it faded away. Maybe it might help us in this 
confused and contentious time today, but I don't think it does help, actually. I suppose that's my random conclusion. History doesn't teach us any lessons. Sorry, I think historians are selling you a pup when they say it does. But there will be more censure next time. Probably theatre, drama, plays, things like that. But it will also include more posturing and rhetorical exaggerations. Until then, keep your hands clean and your minds filthy. Thank you.